Um, my name is John Dillhurst, I'm one of the church wardens here at Rock Saints. Um, and it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Julian Pooley um, to, to, to give this talk. Um, when I read the title, it struck me that it, it, it sounds like something that a mastermind contestant uh, would choose as their esoteric specialist topic. Um, it, it's hard to imagine a world in which there were no magazines. Uh, when we look at the shelves in W. H. Smith supermarkets and see the plethora of magazines that are available these days, to think of a world where there were no magazines at all, when Gentleman's Magazine was the, the first one on the, on the racks, it's, it's a, a, an astonishing view into another world. Julian tells me he's going to introduce himself, so I won't attempt the biographical sketch, uh, but simply content myself by saying, Julian, you are extremely welcome. Look forward very much indeed to what you're going to say, and there will be an opportunity for questions. At the end of Julian's talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me all right at the back? Excellent. Yes, I can introduce myself. Um, I've lived in Kingston from well, since about 1989 when I started work as an archivist at Surrey Record Office, as it was was then, based in County Hall here in Kingston. And um, I've, I've lived here ever since. And about 20 years ago, we moved from Kingston down to a wonderful facility down in Woking called Surrey History Centre, where we brought together the, the county archives from Kingston, from Guildford, and the local studies library that was in Guildford into one site where the history of the county of Surrey is preserved, dating back about 900 years, held on six miles of shelving in our strong rooms. And when we were in that process of moving in, I was absolutely delighted to find that our combined printed sources included a very long run of the Gentleman's Magazine. I've been using the magazine for many years prior to that. Firstly, as a teenage bibliophile, forming the core of my own reference library by haunting jungle sales and antiquarian bookshops around my home in Worcestershire. And then later, as an undergraduate reading medieval history at the University of London, when I realised that the engravings and the detailed descriptions you get of historic buildings and ancient uh, monuments in Gentleman's Magazine give you a really good idea of what those places, many of them parish churches, might have looked like before the restorations and renovations that took place later in the 19th century. So it was during those undergraduate years that I combined my studies with a concerted effort to devote as much of my grant as possible to drinking beer and buying books, that I lighted upon this tiny volume of manuscript pocket diaries in Flask Walk Bookshop in Hampstead. Many of you might know it. Written by a young lady at school with the daughters of John Constable in Hampstead in the 1820s, they seemed a bargain at six pounds. It was only later, when my postgraduate studies to be an archivist were over, that I really had time to sit down and read through them carefully. And it was only then that I realised that they'd been written by the granddaughter of a man called John Nichols, a London printer who'd taken over editorship of the Gentleman's Magazine in 1778, and whose family remained synonymous with it for the next three generations. So the story of how research into that little diary and its background led me to use the tens of thousands of Nichols papers now scattered between over a hundred libraries and archives across the world. And then, as you can see here, to discover many thousands more letters relating to the magazine that had lain undiscovered in attics and cupboards across the country is a talk for another occasion. What I'd like to do today is draw upon this archive to look at the Gentleman's Magazine in more detail, to explain what it was, and more importantly, focus on its amazing value for family and local historians. So it's a national magazine, providing both domestic and foreign news to its thousands of monthly readers at home and overseas. But because Surrey is so close to London, indeed, as you can see in this early map here, before 1889, the ancient county of Surrey stretched all the way from Kingston right up to, to Rotherhide and Peckham in, in the, the northeast of the county. Because Surrey is so close to London, 
its arterial route into Berkshires, Kent, Sussex and Hampshire provided a hotline of news from Surrey parishes right back to the capital. So the magazine is an extraordinary rich resource for the history of Surrey throughout the 18th and the 19th centuries. So for this reason, I'm now leading a wonderful team of volunteers at Surrey History Centre in a project to transcribe every single reference to Surrey and its people um, that appeared in the magazine between 1731 and 1868, when a change in ownership and editorial direction moved its focus away from local and family history. The thousands of Surrey references that we're finding to people, crime, punishment, industry, agriculture, pleasure gardens, antiquities, freak weather, and poetry, as well as the political, social, and religious life of the county, are going to be published in a series of volumes by Surrey Record Society. This talk will draw upon the amazing material that we found and highlight some of the fascinating references to Surrey and indeed to Kingston and its neighbouring parishes that we've discovered. So the Gentleman's Magazine was a, a monthly periodical established by a London printer called Edward Kay in 1731. He lived and worked in St John's Gate in Clerkenwell, a very familiar London landmark now. And an engraved view of this familiar landmark featured on the magazine's title page right the way throughout its life. It was the world's very first magazine in the modern sense of the word. It's a monthly compendium of useful and entertaining information aimed at an increasingly literate public in Georgian Britain. Early 18th century readers were quite literally swamped with print. Newspapers, broadsides, pamphlets, political squibs and journals poured from the presses of London and provincial printers in such huge quantities that nobody could attempt to keep up with them all. Edward Cave's answer was to provide a monthly bouquet, if you like, the most useful articles, presenting his readers with an easily digestive overview of the political life of the country, but also a handy um, almanac of information, crop prices, bills of mortality, list of births, marriages and deaths, promotions to civil, ecclesiastical and military positions, as well as domestic and foreign news, the titles of the latest books that have been published, reports of bad weather, inventions, crimes, executions and discoveries in industry and science and agriculture. It was a national magazine, but with a very local focus. Every January, the magazine printed a list of the high sheriffs of appointed to each county by the Crown. And so here you can see in 1796 that that office was filled by Thomas Sutton of Molesey. The monthly lists of bankruptcies, with the heading usually abbreviated to signify the shame of being insolvent in an increasingly mercantile society, covered the whole country. In this list of bankruptcies for 1764, for example, we can see tradesmen from Westminster, London, the Isle of Wight, Norfolk and Lincolnshire, as well as John Pierce from East Malsey, a victualler, Charles Hart, a grocer from Richmond, and James Gregory, a victualler from Lambeth. References to bankrupts in this area include John Clark, a Kingston Vintner who went bust in 1735, and Thomas Rogers of Ham, who was a bricklayer and failed in business in 1746. What assured the magazine's immediate popularity, however, was its readiness to include contributions from its readers, poetry, articles, and letters to the editor, who, under Cave and all of his successors throughout the 18th and 19th century, was known only as Sylvanus Earl, a benign moderating figure appealing to readers in both the country and in the town. With a monthly print run of over 10,000 copies, many of which would have been read and shared by thousands more readers at home, in academies, coffee houses and provincial book clubs, the magazine reveals the knowledge and opinions of the British reading public on a huge range of topics, religious, political, literary, scientific and the natural world. It allows us to explore the minutiae of daily life in Georgian Britain. 
And it was not just read by gentlemen. In 1811, Jane Porter, a popular novelist who lived in Isha, told the editor that, though yours be professedly a gentleman's magazine, yet ladies find pleasure in its pages. And in 1827, William Bray of Shear, county historian of Surrey, asked the editor to send his copy directly to his house in the country rather than to his London office because his daughters couldn't wait to read it. Cave's magazine did not appear out of nowhere, but what he created was the logical successor of its predecessors. The very earliest literary monthly had been the Gentleman's Journal, published in 1692 by Peter Motto. Cave borrowed both its motto, the Pluribus Unum, and the device of a bouquet of flowers held in a closed hand. The difference between them is that Motto only sought the patronage of the elite classes, not the general reader. Another model might have been John Dunton's Athenian Mercury of 1691, which provided answers to questions posed by alleged readers, but was actually produced by a small team of writers who both set and answered the questions that it published. Like The Spectator and The Tatler, these were didactic publications telling their readers how to behave, how to dress and present themselves in polite society. These elite aspirations had no place in the increasingly political, mercantile and literary world of early 18th century Britain. Kay's most influential models were the Monthly Register, which compared reports of current affairs reported in different news sheets, Abel Boyer's Political State of Great Britain, which was published in 1711, which gave abstracts of books and pamphlets covering current affairs, and the Monthly Chronicle, which was founded in 1728 by a group of London booksellers and which began to include lists of births, deaths and marriages. So Cave drew on all of these ideas and the models of these predecessors, but he modified them to appeal to the tastes of his day. His title page lists the sources of his information. So down that side of the page, you can see all of the uh, London newspapers that he's plundering for snippets of news, from the London Gazette and the London Journal, right way through the Craftsman, and then you've got the Daily Journal, and the London Evening Weekly News, and the General Evening News, right the way through to the London Daily Post. That's his London newspapers that he's using. But more widely, he's taking papers from York, five from Dublin, two from Edinburgh, Bristol, Ipswich, Reading, Canterbury, Boston in Massachusetts, Jamaica and Barbados in order to provide an overview of provincial and overseas news for his readers. And then he crammed all of that information into a quite utilitarian set format which barely changed over the course of the next 150 years. Open any copy of the Gentleman's Magazine from 1731 right the way through to 1868, and those are the main chapter headings that you can expect to find. What you won't find in the magazine are any advertisements. These were printed on the monthly wrapper that accompanied each monthly issue, and very few of these survived because at the end of each year, an extra supplement, a preface, and an index were published. And many readers took that opportunity to tear these wrappers off, consign them to waste paper, and then bind their 12 monthly issues of the index and the preface, etc., into an annual volume, which is what you normally find in a bookshop today. So that's a typical couple of images of that monthly wrapper that I found on Google. And here we see a wrapper that I found in the papers of Sir John Fenn in Norfolk Record Office. This had been used to wrap up a few family papers in the Fenn papers in Norfolk Record Office. But you can see that that's what you had for the March edition of 1789. It cost a shilling. And these are the books um, being published by and printed by John Nichols that readers might have been interested in. But why was the magazine so successful? Well, mainly, I think, because it was such an effective means of communication, not just of news, but of the latest advances in science, industry, politics and culture. In 1749, a reader in Lancashire compared the magazine to the ocean because it was a vehicle of intelligence, 
dispersing the ideas and improvements around the world in the same way that the seas carried ships and the seeds of many plants. Rather than publish expensive pamphlets and books to promote their inventions, people actually sent letters and drawings of their discoveries to the magazine because they knew that they would reach a much wider audience at a fraction of the cost. So in, 18, in, in 1771, Cuthbert Clark shared his designs for an engine to raise water for the lake at Paynes Hill Park in Surrey, which was operated by just one horse, and the one hour could raise over 400 hogsheads of water to the height of 12 feet. And in 1774, John Arbuthnot of Ravensbury in Mitcham spared no expense in his endeavours to promote new methods and tools of husbandry. His letter to the magazine was accompanied by this lovely engraved plate of the instruments that he'd invented with detailed instructions for building them for yourself at home. Having said that, of course, the magazine also received and published many other weird and frankly rather strange contributions that reflect the enormous inventiveness and diversity of the 18th century imagination. There was an enormous amount of correspondence in the magazine in the 1730s about where the animals might have been stored on Noah's Ark. This was a matter of some import. You would not put the cats next to the dogs, for example, if you're going to be stuck on that halt for 40 days and nights. Um, so theologians and scholars around the country sent in letters describing exactly where each species would have been kept, on which floor, and occasionally, as you can see here, they were sending in sketches as well. It was something they took very seriously indeed. And then later in the century, in response to all the balloon flights that were taking place in the 1780s, a correspondent in 1786 sent in a letter describing an airship that had been invented by a Brazilian priest in 1709 that could travel 200 miles in 24 hours, provide kings with the ability to send orders directly to their generals in the field, and merchants the ability to send goods and letters to distant countries. And helpfully, they included an engraving of this fantastic airship. It's, it's worth looking at, actually. Here we have, obviously, there's the captain um, with his telescope seeing where he's going. And if that failed, he's got the 18th century equivalent of sat-nav on either side to help him. It looks like it's jet-propelled to me. God knows what that means. Um, Royal standards flying. And, and then if the jet-propelled um, mechanism fails, you've got a wing, wings to help it on its way. Fascinating um, example of the 18th century imagination. But the magazine also pioneered the use of engraved maps to illustrate foreign countries. This was a move that had an enormous effect on the readers of Georgian England, because hitherto, maps in this detail here we see one of the West Indies. Maps like this have been luxury items available only to those who could actually afford them. Now, with pull-out illustrations in each copy of the magazine, the horizons of the common reader were infinitely expand expanded. So alongside this lovely view of the West Indies, um, we have this um, interesting view of a lunar eclipse that took place, in the, I think, in the 1770s, with details of how that would look, not just from around the country, but around the world as well. And then there were also colour plates inserted, hand-coloured um, by Cave's staff. Here we see a plate of a Baltimore bird in a Virginian tulip tree from the 1740s. Cave and his successes also understood the appetite of the reading public for lurid and sensational stories. And every month, the magazine printed lists of the criminals convicted at quarter sessions and assizes across the country, along with details of their crimes. In 1767, the nation was horrified by the sadistic cruelty inflicted by Elizabeth Brownrigg upon her female apprentices. She lived in Fetter Lane, running north from Fleet Street towards Hobart and was highly respected locally as the local midwife to be entrusted with the custody of several young female apprentices from the nearby Foundling Hospital. Behind closed doors, however, she was a monster, severely punishing her girls with sadistic physical abuse, which often involved suspending them naked from a wooden beam in her kitchen and whipping them. Though one of her charges managed to run back to the Foundling and raise the alarm, nobody took her seriously. 
and the abuse continued until neighbours, whose windows overlooked her yard, raised their concerns to the family, and then other girls were found starved and dying in cellars and cupboards around the premises. It's a very alarming example of the risks that were faced by pauper children when they were apprenticed out to tradesmen across the parish who were at their mercy for up to seven vulnerable years. Brownrigg and her son fled south of the river and hid in a chandler's shop in Wandsworth. They disguised themselves as man and wife, lay together in the same bed and kept themselves very retired. But the master of the shop, reading the advertisement describing them and offering a reward for apprehending them, recognised them and dashed up to tell Mr Owen, who was the church warden at St Dunstan's in Fleet Street. They returned to Wandsworth with the two constables and arrested the couple, couple who were found guilty of murder and promptly executed. The magazine reported all of this in horrible detail in several monthly numbers and they even included, and look away now if you're easily offended, they even included an illustration bringing the atrocity of her crimes to the general public. Local crimes and violent incidents filled the news columns throughout the century. In this slide, we see a report of proceedings here in Kingston at the Assizes in 1735, when William Sweet and Philip Wilkinson were sentenced to death for sacrilege because they'd stolen gold tassels and lace from the cushion and pulpit in Kingston Church. I helped myself to this lectern earlier, I hope that's all right. <laughs> and, and John Robinson, just down the page here, John Robinson, a physic gardener of Mitcham, was also sent to the gallows for assaulting John Taylor, a peddler near Tooty, robbing him of sixpence, and, helped by the peddler's wife, who was dressed in man's clothing, cutting out part of his tongue so he couldn't spit on them. Most of these executions took place on Kennington Common. On Friday the 6th of April 1739, three highwaymen and a housebreaker were hanged in Kennington. One of them had previously been a shoemaker and the surgeons were very keen to claim his body for anatomy classes, but it was wrestled from their grasp by the shoemaker's fellow craftsman who took it home in triumph to his widow. God knows what she must have thought of it. Well, she wouldn't accept it, obviously, so the exasperated shoemakers hawked it around for several hours, offering it for sale to all the apothecaries between Horsley Down and Rotherhide at a very cheap rate. But finding no buyer, they covered it in pitch and buried it in St George's Fields, where I presume it remains. Highwaymen were always a problem around London, particularly in Surrey. Here in 1783, we see a report of a young highwayman probably under 18, who relieved John Cooper and his wife of 30 guineas in a gold watch on the road between Mitchell and Carshalton. He was only on a grey pony, but he managed to outrun a contingent of the light horse that from the neighbourhood had set off after him. The accounts of proceedings at the Assize and the Quarter Sessions courts held in Kingston show that many people were either sent to the House of Correction or the town jail. Conditions in both of these institutions in Kingston were grim. In 1804, the magazine included a very lengthy report by James Neild, a prison reformer, of his visits to these institutions in 1802. Here we see his report of the visit to the House of Correction, which had been purchased by the County of Surrey in 1761. Prisoners were given just a pound of bread each day and only water to drink. There were separate wards for men and women. Rooms were barely 16 feet square, with just two windows with shutters, no glass. There was a separate room for faulty apprentices, measuring 8 feet by 11. The county allowed nothing but straw to lie on, and at the time of Neil's visit, there were 18 men and 4 women in that house of correction. The town jail also served as a debtor's prison. Neild was horrified by the case of Richard Holt, confined there for debt of six guineas and costs over three guineas. The poor man told Neild that he brought up his wife and children, ten children no less, without any assistance from the parish. But having been in confinement for eleven weeks, his wife and three youngest children were now in the workhouse. There was no allowance provided for him, not even water. He was confined in a narrow slip 14 feet long by 3 feet wide, with an iron grated window towards the street, 
and from here he had to stand and beg. The keeper told Neil that he frequently made application to the borough bailiffs for a daily allowance, but they denied it. The jailer had no salary at all to run that institution. Instead, he kept a licensed alehouse within the jail to support himself and finance it. It was run by Kingston Corporation, but they supplied neither beds or bedding. Felons due to appear at the next assizes were crowded in like sheep in a pen for two or three days in a room measuring just 19 feet by nine. They were fastened down to staples fixed in the floor by a ponderous iron chain running through the link of their fetters. One blanket was given to each prisoner. There was no courtyard, no water accessible to them, the rooms were dirty, they were not whitewashed, and the butcher's shambles were downstairs, so you can imagine what that was like in summer. Prisoners could also be sent to the Hut Surrey House of Correction up in Southwark, where conditions, though harsh, were somewhat better. In 1822, the magazine reported that the prisoners were being put to good character building hard work on a specially made treadmill. The magazine is particularly useful for the history of health and medicine. Most years include the London Bills of Mortality, which were kept by parish clerks in the City of London, Bethnal Green, but also Bermondsey and Hackney, that provide extraordinary and often quite poignant statistics for causes of death and numbers of fatalities throughout the capital. The information was gathered together on a weekly basis, and the aim was to give warnings of epidemics and an overview of general fluctuations in disease and death. So the supplement for 1804 in the magazine includes these detailed bills of mortality showing that 4,881 children had died under the age of two and over 1,900 more under the age of five. 21,500 people had been baptised that year and 17,000 buried. And the causes of death are given. They include over 3,500 from consumption 792 from dropsy, which is a sort of congestive heart failure. 622 people have died of smallpox. Four have died from evil. I'm not entirely sure what that means, but it doesn't sound very nice. Um, five from grief, the fifth from grief, and one was killed by a wild boar. I assume that it might have escaped from Smithfield Meat Market, but we don't know. Readers were fascinated by medicine. In an age before antibiotics and anaesthetics, the slightest twinge or weakness could be the harbinger of excruciating or debilitating illness. Readers, many of whom were local doctors and apothecaries, sent in their own infallible cures for the bite of a mad dog or the bloody flux, gravel and stone, with letters from happy and relieved patients testifying to their success. The magazine for 1751, for example, includes two testimonials by William Browning, a prominent merchant of St. Mary Magdalene in Bermondsey, and St. James Allwright of Lambeth, praising the miraculous cures for gout that they'd received from the medicines of Mr. Drake and the apothecary of St. Olaf's in Southwark. The lists of deaths frequently reported the gallons of fluid that had been drained from dropsical patients. Here we see a fascinating table of the quantities of liquid that were removed from the unfortunate Mrs. Horton of Leicestershire between 1780. Did you enjoy your lunch, no? No, no, no. Between 1789 and 1797, you can see um, it says that 1,776 pints of water weighing 2,193 pounds were drained from her. But reports of the advances in surgery were equally popular and sometimes accompanied by an engraved illustration for those wishing to try it for yourself at home. Here we see a lovely um, description of cataract surgery using a knife rather than scissors, as described by Mr. Sharp, surgeon to Guy's Hospital to the readers of the magazine in 1754. I will spare you the description of that. And I will also spare you the description of this very alarming device. It's a sponge fixed to a long probe made, made out of whalebone. Suffice it to say that it was designed to clean the esophagus and stomach, but you'll notice at the top, never quite caught on. 
Even royalty was caught up in this fascination for medical science. In January 1761, the magazine included a full report of the autopsy of King George II, who died the previous October, including this extraordinary engraving of his diseased heart. I think cases like this vividly capture the wonderful diversity of 18th century medicine, and they complement the accounts that you often find in the family papers that we hold at Surrey History Centre. Rabies was rife across the country, and it caused visceral fear among people everywhere. In 1748, Mr Newbold of the Grange in Southwark had to be tied down to his bed for several days before he died. And despite the trusted but sadly ineffective remedy of dipping a person in salt water, a young girl of nine in Roehampton, who was bit six weeks before by a mad dog, died raving mad. In 1768, Mrs. Hutchins of Mitcham died from the bite of a mad cat. As well as reflecting the rapid changes in science and medicine in the 18th century, the magazine is also a key source for the study of English literature. It printed the verse of many budding poets and reviewed the earliest publications of many very famous authors. Thousands of people submitted poetry and translations of Greek or Latin verses to the editor. Most of them are simply dreadful. But some are very useful for family and local historians. In 1732, for instance, there's a wonderful poem called Car Scholten Fair, a rhapsodical fragment which provides a lovely description of this country fair against a moral tale of the dangers presented by such pleasures. Pickpockets, fraudsters, drunkenness, amorous adventures, and infection with the pox. There's a similar moral tale in a poem about Croydon Workhouse, also dating from 1732, where the clerk in charge was rather too helpful to a particularly young and beautiful inmate, with the inevitable result that she became pregnant and he lost his job becoming a pauper himself. It's quite common to find poetical epitaphs in memory of local people in the poetry section of the magazine. Here we see verses published in 1800 in memory of Robert, a soldier in the Kingston Company of the 1st Battalion of the Surrey Militia. He died while on service in Devon in 1762, and his fellow soldiers had voluntarily contributed to his stone in, in memory of him in Barnstable Churchyard. The verses were penned by their captain, Francis Gross, and begin, No more to see his Surrey's native skies, no more to bless a longing parent's eyes. Local weather and events were also reported in the magazine. Here we see a study of cloud formations that accompanied a letter from the correspondent who went on to classify them. The meteorological reports that appeared every month from 1751 were a very important source for the impact of the weather on the capital's economic and social history. Many of these um, reports were compiled by Thomas Holt White, brother of the naturalist Gilbert White, who lived in Lambeth. They provide a fascinating glimpse of Surrey's weather in the mid-18th century. But the reports of severe weather you find in the historical chronicle section allow us to share the fear that people felt when the weather was particularly unstable. On the 15th of October, 1780, a most violent whirlwind or tornado burst upon Hammersmith, Roehampton, Richmond and Kingston. At Roehampton, a barn with some poor people in it was blown down and a stable full of horses was destroyed. The effects of the lightning on the ground of the fields and of the storm of the largest trees was most astonishing, drawing many spectators. And there are reports that the storm carried a large seed tree clear right across the Thames. On the 19th of July, 1735, the magazine reported that wheat was selling in Kingston at 11 shillings and tenpence, the price being raised by the excessive wet weather, which in many places had laid the corn flat. The Thames had been so swelled that in many places the farmers were forced to carry their hay up to the hills in order to make it. Later in the century, in February 1795, the magazine reported that the River Thames rose to a height not known since 1774. Much of Kingston looked like a Dutch town, and punts plied about the streets. The inhabitants of all the houses near the river were driven upstairs and supplied by means of boats at the windows. In February 1754, and again in January 1777, 
Severe cold weather froze the river above Kingston Bridge so that people could walk across in safety. Here we see a report of a storm over Kingston in 1805 when the chimneys of Dr Chambers' house were struck by lightning which then passed into the parlour of Mr Cheney, the builder, melting the plate on the sideboard and setting fire to the paper and bedding in his bedroom. Domestic news like this was usually reported in a section called Domestic Occurrences, and the magazine is a great source for local news items that add personal details to the official reports or court proceedings. In January 1764, Edward Dillon, a paymaster sergeant in Elliot's Light Horse, having courted the chambermaid at the Bull Inn in Kingston, procured a licence and fixed the day of the marriage but then found himself disappointed by an unlucky quarrel with her. In a fit of rage, he loaded a brace of pistols, went into the kitchen and fired one of them at her without speaking a word. The ball, luckily, only grazed her side, but then he took a second aim, discharged the other pistol and dangerously wounded her in the back. He then took to his room, reloaded both pistols and swore he'd shoot the first man who entered the room but an officer with a file of men soon obliged him to lay down his arms and he was sent to the Surrey jail. The ball was extracted from the girl's back and she made a full recovery. Here we see the accidental death reported of a sheep rustler at Mitcham. He tied its hind legs together and he put them over his forehead to carry it away. But when he tried to cross a gate, the sheep had slipped and the rope slipped down to his neck and, and face and throat and he was then strangled. So they found the sheep hanging on one side of the, the stile and this man's life, his corpse, was on the other. Literature and antiquities and biography became a fundamental feature of the Gentleman's Magazine after the arrival of John Nichols as editor and printer in 1778. Although Nichols largely maintained the successful formula established by his predecessors, he introduced changes that ensured the magazine's survival long into the following century, enriching its usefulness for us today. The move away from reprinted articles designed, uh, digested by an editorial team had begun in the in Cave's lifetime. Regular accusations of literary piracy led him to increasingly seek original contributions and to cultivate a wide circle of customer correspondence. By 1754, nearly all of the magazine was contributed by its readers, often writing to each other through the medium of the magazine, so the contents are as diverse as the magazine's huge audience. Most of them, like the editor himself, disguised themselves beside, behind pseudonyms. Some would use the initial letters of their names, others the last letters. Some used anagrams or Greek or Latin supercase, and several would use cryptic puzzles that are only now being solved by scholars. Typical of these, William Bray of Shear, who I think in this portrait by John Linnell bears an uncanny resemblance to the first Doctor Who, William Hartnell, don't you think? William Bray was a regular correspondent of the magazine from as early as 1773, but he never signed his articles. He either used WB or, more usually, AZ. We don't know the identity of the writer who signed himself as observer, but his letter to, of the 12th of December 1804, giving hints to the Corporation of Kingston upon Thames, is a masterpiece of scathing criticism that still rings true today. He begins, as you can see, by praising Kingston as one of the oldest of towns of England, celebrating key points in its illustrious history, its antiquity, royal charters, and significance as a major river crossing between London and the South Coast. But then he goes on over several pages to lament the atrocious state of the roads, complaining that the pavement is broken up in many places, the channels narrow, jagged and deep, the drains stagnant and offensive and in summer infectious. The bridge is hazardous. What is the council thinking of? Does it not levy rates? A lamentable and listless apathy prevails among these townsmen, he writes, threatening the transfer of the assizes to another Surrey town. Nichols encouraged his readers to supply letters, essays, poems, illustrations and short notices to an extent not seen before. His office in Red Lion Passage, just running north of Fleet Street, 
became the focus of a huge correspondence between Sylvanus Urban and an enormous contributing readership. In 1783, he doubled the length of the magazine to allow more space for essays on historical subjects and reviews of books in place of simple lists of new publications. Not everyone was convinced by this change. Owen Manning, who was the director of Gobbleming in Surrey, grumbled that he saw little reason to fill his shelves with similar fodder at twice the rate. But Nichols had brought with him a great many uh, literary and antiquarian connections that enabled the magazine to flourish more than ever before as a place for scholarly debate. By opening the pages of the magazine to an increasingly literary public, Nichols inextricably linked Sylvanus Urban to that network of amateur writers, antiquaries, book clubs, and debating scientific and philosophical societies that flourished across the country in the late 18th century. Sylvanus Urban allowed his myriad correspondents in town and country to have their say in the clamour of debate about ideas, culture, and taste. And the building that you can see at the end of this passageway is now all that remains of this busy focus of literary activity. Many of these discussion threads were actually started by Nichols himself, who submitted letters to the magazine under a range of pseudonyms. These are all the pseudonyms that he used that I've managed to identify from the magazine. Some of them are straightforward. Islingtoniensis is straightforward because he was born in Islington and lived there in his retirement. Um, M. Green, or Martha Green, was the name of his second wife. So that's, that was always a favourite. Um, an old citizen and an old correspondent, uh, fairly straightforward. And one by Ensis, he was descended from a family in, one of his wives was descended from a family in Leicestershire called One By. So these are all clues that we can follow to uh, identify him as a correspondent. Under his editorship, uh, editorship, the magazine became a lively forum for national debate. A great many letters from the 1780s onwards discussed the latest antiquarian research. Most of the articles about Surrey's churches and local history were contributed by William Bray, who went on to complete the three-volume History and Antiquities of Surrey by his friend Owen Manning. The magazine for 1798, for example, includes this letter and engravings describing the churches of East and West Clandon. The letter itself is signed AZ, and Bray describes the stained glass and notes that at West Clandon the roof collapsed one Sunday morning just before Christmas service in 1716. He also tells us that about 30 years before that, which would make it about 1768, the church had been given a new ceiling and neatly and uniformly pewed by Lord Onslow. And he then goes on to describe the monumental inscriptions in some detail. Bray's contribution about Clandon is just one of several useful articles in the magazine about Surrey's churches. In 1797, an unidentified writer, who simply signed himself as S, described Frencham Church and provided this plate and details of the font in the scene. This anonymous plate of Addington Church was published in 1799, and W.C. Dendy submitted this description of Lye Church in 1728, accompanied by a charming description and, and engraving. When the antiquary James Pell and Malcolm visited Kingston to draw the church in 1798, he reported how he had conversed with the granddaughter of the sexton buried by the forward of the chapel. She took him to the north door to show him part of a rude pillar which fell in the building, showed him a fine, rich, richly painted glory with cherubim over the entrance to the nave, and then pointed out how it was only possible to read the inscription on the tomb of Robert Skern and his wife if your face was facing towards the east because it lay in, on the pavement. In 1809, a correspondent signing themselves simply as I sent in this view of the interior of the Love King Chapel, along with a brief description of its situation on the main road, surrounded by wavy foliage. But 18th century churches were not simply museums of monumental inscriptions. Non-conformity was sweeping religious change right across the country, and Surrey was frequently caught up in the fever of religious debate. In 1752, a substantial parishioner of Wandsworth, lately turned Methodist, called the Reverend Mr. Allison, the minister of the parish, out of his pulpit, 
through the cushion and the books out of the reading desk and among the congregation and did other mischief before he could be secured. Again, on Friday the 14th of March, 1760, a terrible riot happened at Kingston in Surrey, occasioned by a Methodist minister who came there and brought a great number of people together in a barn to hear him. While he was preaching, a fellow threw some dirt at him, which made a great disturbance, and the mob at last dragged the preacher into the street and rolled him into a ditch. And had it not been for the humanity of a gentleman nearby who took him into his house, he would probably have been murdered. Some of the Inniskillin dragoons being among the mob with their swords wounded several people and put the whole town in an alarm. But the prudent behaviour of their commanding officer ensured that all consequences were prevented. He ordered the drums to beat, assembled the dragoons in the Sun Inn yard and kept them there quietly for some time, ordering them to behave peaceably. The established church also went on to changes, particularly in the 1780s when Lord Hardwick successfully sought to regulate marriage by legislation that included the reading of bans of marriage in church before the wedding. Although the changes were widely welcomed, the magazine reported that in Kingston, when the minister began to read the Marriage Act, almost all of the congregation just got up and walked out of the church. But for many of us, the biographical details will probably be the most fascinating. The magazine had always listed deaths and said a few words about the deceased, but what makes these early obituaries so important is the fact that quite often they concern to very ordinary people. Characters who are now utterly lost to us, apart from a dry reference in a burial register, but whose lives, personalities and foibles are preserved in print in the pages of the magazine. Take Edmund James, for example, who died in his house on Ham Common in December 1809. He practised many years as an attorney, the poor man's friend and counsellor, uniformly recommending an amiable adjustment of differences in preference to litigation. He was a pleasing companion, possessing a fund of innocent mirth and a heart overflowing with the milk of human kindness. Charitable without ostentation, pious without austerity, his loss will be sincerely lamented by the poor of its vicinity. Equally lamented was Philip Courtney, the landlord of the Robin Hood public house and the first lieutenant of the Kingston Volunteers who died in January 1811. His it will be long and deeply felt by his family and friends to whom he was endeared by every social tie. And in 1816 we have a typically long and detailed obituary of George Savage of Service and Lodge. He'd been vicar of Kingston since 1790 and we're given information about his education, his career, friendships, scholarships, personality and his funeral. John Nichols gave obituaries like this a central place in the magazine, encouraging family and friends of the deceased to send anecdotes, letters and memoirs of them that he would then work up into full-scale death notices. In fact, he collected so much material for the families of the deceased that in 1790, John Walcott, writing as Peter Pinder, satirised him in his benevolent epistle to Sylvanus Urban, calling him a death hunter. But this is a bit unfair because it was through the obituary columns of the Gentleman's Magazine and the various biographical works that Nichols based upon him that a body of biography was created for which we owe him an incalculable debt. It's impossible to quantify the number of whole phrases and paragraphs that the contributors of the old Dictionary of National Biography lifted directly from Nichols. But in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, which is available online, it's cited over 6,000 times. The births, marriages and deaths of Surrey people appear pretty well every month and show that illuminating anecdotes were by no means confined to the obituaries. In this entry from the Historical Chronicle section of December 1748, we read the horrific story of how, at a christening in Beddington, the nurse was so intoxicated that after she'd undressed the child, Instead of laying it in the cradle, she put it behind a large fire, which burnt it to death in a few minutes. She was examined before the magistrate and said she was quite stupid and senseless, as she mistook the child for a log of wood. So she was discharged. As part of our project for Surrey Record Society, we're checking all of these references against the parish registers, and we think 
this unfortunate child may have been William, son of Henry and Mary Whitler, baptised on the 4th of December 1748 and buried on the 6th. In May 1733, we read of the marriage of Sir John Lee of Abington, um, worth 3,000 a year, to, and he was aged nearly 70, as you can see, to Miss Wade, who was aged only 18, daughter of Mr. Wade, the local apothecary, who had lately cured Sir John of a mortification in his tongue. The Addington Parish Register um, that we hold at Surrey History Centre is actually damaged quite badly, and we've been able to find a reference to that marriage in it. So this is just one of several instances where the Gentleman's Magazine is the only source for this genealogical information. The entry below is worth noticing while we're here. It's a typical example of so many marriages reported in the magazine where only the husband's name is given. The name of his beloved was of no interest at all, only the 6,000 dowry that she brought with her. Other marriages were less formal. On the 2nd of August 1744, John Maddox, the centurion man of war, married the widow of Mr. Simons, a late wire drawer, with £1,000. £1, Forty of the crew attended the ceremony and afterwards proceeded in coaches with a band of music to Croydon. Well, that sounds like a wonderful occasion. Unlike the chaotic scenes at St. Olaf's in Southwark on the 5th of November 1770, when the marriage of Michael Thomas, a black man, and Anne Brandley, a white woman, was disrupted by a press gang who barged into the church in search of recruits for the Navy. The clergyman received a blow on the breast and the poor black and his bride made their escape in fury. Additional information is often included in the next issue of the magazine. Here we see um, a report of the sudden death of the Reverend Thomas Fylwood of Nicolum on the 10th of August 1800. But in the next issue, we learn that he had in fact taken his own life. He'd been in a despondent state for some time and had been disposed to put an end to his life. His family had carefully hidden all the knives and anything that he would use to harm himself out of his reach. But then tragically, his son, who was in the army, came home one day and inadvertently left his gun on the table while he went to the horse, to the stable to see his horse um, cared for. While he was away, the old gentleman seized the opportunity to shoot himself through the head. No coroner's papers survived for Surrey for 1800, and it would be over 60 years before Surrey had a local newspaper. So the Gentleman's Magazine is often the only source for this very personal information about our ancestors. Parish registers, though essential for family history, are often no more than simple lists of names and dates. It's rare to learn anything about the people whose lives we glimpse through the events they record. For me, reading the Gentleman's Magazine is rather like walking invisibly through a busy and crowded Georgian town encountering the characters that were familiar in the streets, the theatres, the workhouses, the pubs of the time, but who have now completely vanished from sight. So as I hope I've shown this afternoon, the Gentleman's Magazine was a, a national periodical which nevertheless had a very local focus, covering domestic news, personal tragedies, Britain's contributions to the advances of the Enlightenment, and the political and religious turmoil of the Georgian period with an engaging immediacy that continues to make it a joy to read. We have a great deal of ground yet to cover in our project to transcribe and explain every reference to Surrey that is preserved in its pages over the 18th and 19th centuries. But I very much hope that what you've heard this afternoon will encourage you to visit your local record office or local studies library, and in turning the pages of the magazine, walk through this gateway to discover the world experienced by your Georgian ancestors for yourself. Thank you very much. Julian, thank you for that absolutely fascinating insight into life in Kingston almost centuries ago. A reminder that people were born, um, grew up, lived, married, died, worked, um, in a way just like us. Um, and recorded in the pages of this excellent magazine. Alistair has actually got a bound copy of the Gentleman's Magazine in his, in his bag. Would you care to brandish it for us, Alistair? And while Alistair's doing that, are there any questions that you would like to put
we would like to put it to you. Please. Um, yeah, the, one of the prisons was on the site of the old post office, which is now being redeveloped, I think. I'm not sure, and I'm not sure where the other one was. They, you know. to the, uh, the Kingston House of Correction that, that um, the editor had noted that um, these institutions served as nothing more than nurseries for prisons. Yes. Um, but the, the, the prison reform movement was obviously very much alive. Well, Giles, did you have a, a comment? I think you better use the microphone at this point, Giles. When it came to real problems like Catholic um, emancipation, how did the Gentleman's Magazine deal with that? <laughs> That's an interesting question, because I was reading that bit last night on the way home on the train. Um, it was, I think it's in, I'm reading the issue for 1825 at the moment. And there was a lot of talk about Catholic emancipation then. And the magazine was, it comes out very much against it. It was not happy. Um, and it said some pretty rude things about Catholics based on the experience of what they were witnessing in Ireland and the, what they called the, the ignorance of the Irish people and the superstition, which shows that though the, I think it says the, the monster of popery may lay slain, the virus of superstition still runs through its veins. Um, so, yes, the magazine was always very, you know, fairly pro-establishment and um, careful to tread a fine line. So you often find throughout the, um, obviously the, the, throughout the French Revolution, it, it is very pro-government monarchy and the Rose of Beef of Old England, very anti-Catholic and very traditionalist in its outlook. One of the reasons for that, obviously, was well, probably it wanted to appeal to the majority of the reading public. But also, Nichols's printer, he was also the printer of the votes of the Houses of House of Lords. He had a very lucrative job in there, and that's where he made most of his money. So he didn't want to upset the apple cart by coming out on any political wing. So should we just have a look at the, uh, the, the volume of the downstairs? Oh, lovely. And these are your family copies of them? Yes. It all strikes me with, with ancient books, just how small they are. <laughs> how small the print is, and whether they were issued with magnifying glasses. Paul. So this one's got the account of the execution of Dick Turpin in it, which is a good read, actually. Um, there was an execution on the same day in Kingston, and I remember looking at them both, thinking it, in one of my talks whether I could combine the two, um, but so there wasn't room. But yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you. you could I ask you a couple of yeah. questions, please? Um, it's called the Gentleman's Magazine. Was it actually aimed to gentlemen or was it read by everybody? And the second question is, how was the magazine distributed? Uh, was it read by many people? It was. It was aimed at Gentleman's Magazine. Um, it was aimed at really at the aspiring merchant classes who aspired to be gentlemen rather than the nobility, although the nobility filled the ranks of its birth, marriage and death columns. And obviously the political reporting. But if you were um, an aspiring tradesman in Kingston in the 18th century, you would have wanted to take this because as well as keeping you informed about public affairs, it would have um, told you who was going bust locally, told you about local businesses, kept you up to, up to date with local news, but also informed you about the latest discoveries or advances in science that might have helped your trade. You know, there were stock prices in there, so you had an overview of the economy. 
but also to have a set of these on the wall above your shop front or whatever showed your customers that you were a man who was learned, well read. Um, it said a lot about you. Um, so it was aimed at, at aspiring artisans and gentlemen, and then you increasingly see that as, as the century progresses, as their marriages and deaths feature more than those of the nobility. It was distributed in very many different ways. You could actually get it sent directly to you by Edward Cave from St. John's Gate. But you would also, you could buy it from your local bookseller. If you could have it sent um, by the carrier's wagons from the booksellers in Paternoster Row behind St. Paul's Cathedral, the heart of London's book trade, would include bundles of the magazine going all over the country um, each month. It was distributed by um, Newbury's booksellers, which were on the corner of St. Paul's Churchyard. They specialised in children's books. Their site of their shop is now where Marks and Spencer's is, just outside Marks, but outside St. Paul's. Um, they were the main distributors, so it would be packed up, sent there, and then distributed around the country. So a different way, but then once it got to the local village, then it would have been read by people in the local school, it would have been read by people in the local book club. Gentlemen would have read it to their servants, families would have read it to their children. So it's estimated that each of the 10,000 copies produced each month would have been read by about five and a half people. So you've got 50,000 people. That's a big audience. Thank you. Great. The uh, slave industry. Any mention of slaves and plantation owners? Yes, a lot. There are a lot of mentions of um, plantation owners and their wealth and their success and their early death from tropical disease if they've made a mistake going out to see their plantations. Um, but there's also an underlying current throughout the magazine of discussion about the pros and cons of slavery. And the magazine was pretty firmly against it, although it did also publish arguments strongly in favour of it. Um, so it's a very important source of studying the, um, the attitudes of contemporary people to the transport of humanity from one side of the world to another and the indignities that, and the atrocities that were caused. But the, again, you also get reports of these vicious uprisings by the blacks who were burning their innocent white masters. So it's, it's balanced in two ways. But it's a very important source for the whole story. The, uh, the two o'clock bell has struck uh, a few moments ago. This will be the last question, and it's from Isabel Robertson. Um, yeah, it's not really so much of a question. It's just a slight follow-up to the, what you were saying about the people buying books and you know subscribing. Um, I've also come across evidence of people, you know, collect, collecting back numbers and swapping and um, selling to each other as well. And this was about the 1830s, I think. Yeah, there was a big trade in that. Even, even from the word go, okay, it was reprinting popular issues of the magazine. So I've, I've got an issue of the magazine at home, the 1731, but I've worked out that it's actually printed in 1739. So they're constantly being reissued. So Julian, thank you very much indeed. Um, there's clearly material uh, in the pages of this magazine for several more talks. <laughs> Should you ever feel inclined to come back to us, you'll be very, very welcome. Um, our parish archives um, are in the very capable hands of Julian and his colleagues at the Surrey History Centre, uh, brilliantly catalogued um, uh, and just absolutely fascinating to dip into. So we know they're in very good hands indeed, Julian. Thank you very much indeed. Do come back. <laughs>